Okay, so um, what I'm here to talk about is totally non-technical. However, given that site surveys are such an important part of the vertical that we work in, getting our gear from A to B and actually being able to execute the site survey without significant <coughs> problems with the delivery of the kit, delays, customs, import duties, these sorts of things is an important characteristic to know. So my team handles EMEAR, so we deal with projects all throughout um, Middle East, um, Africa, Russia, Europe. And as a result of this, we've run into, let's say, not just one or two problems in the process of shipping. Getting gear from A to B can be really, really simple, but under circumstance, it can be a nightmare. So what I'm here today to present is basically just an overview. What hurdles have we hit in the past so you guys in your projects, your deployments can kind of avoid tripping up on the same issues when you go out and want to actually deploy or survey on a, on a specific site. So in the past, within Cisco, the services team would ship out of a place called Halberg Moose. It's close to Munich. Um, and basically, as a result of shipping out of there, we, we typically had a relatively central location without, within Europe, at least, to be able to get our gear from A to B. In other theaters in North America and APAC, we've got different locations. I believe in North America is out of Richardson and APAC out of Sydney. But within Europe, we typically went for a central European location to a large extent to avoid issues that you typically have with customs and duty and this sort of thing with European-based shipments. The thing is, if we're dealing with EMEAR, you've not necessarily always dealing with shipping within Europe and under circumstance, you're running into issues with customs. So the locations which, just a handful of the locations which I remember in the last years that, that we shipped out to are listed up here. The challenging ones are typically the ones in Africa and Middle East. They're the ones which we've run in, into the largest amount of issues and they're the ones to really take extra special care when you're shipping out to. Now, in Europe, the key things to take into account are when you're shipping out gear, the manifest, what is in your shipping container, your, your box, your, your case, that this is up to date. It's always possible that somebody intercepts or stops your shipment and thinks, okay, the battery which is in there may not be compliant or anything else. And if you don't have the paperwork, getting that system or getting that, that shipment out of wherever it's stuck becomes all the more challenging. They try and call you at odd hours, you don't get in touch with them, and instead of your shipment getting there on the Thursday that it was supposed to, it ends up getting there three weeks, four weeks later. Batteries. Now, there are batteries, and many manufacturers say, say that their batteries are shipping safe. And this may be the case that they are shipping safe, the batteries, but the, the problem <laughs> with batteries is only certain types are typically allowed to be shipped on certain types of, of um, transport methods. Some are not allowed on planes and some that are even marked as being permitted, you may run into the specific challenges. Now the, the next thing, and this is something which is specific if you're shipping out to customer sites is DAP and DDP. Anybody who knows what these terms actually mean has probably gone through the, the stress of choosing the wrong method. Now with batteries, quite often if you're sending them by air, you're going to have questions for specific documentation. This is an example of a certification for a certain model of batteries. It's an IATA certification. Often without this certification, you won't be able to get your batteries on a plane, okay? And even if you have this certification, depending on the airline, they may still stop you. We've had scenarios where engineers are hand carrying batteries, they've had the documentation, and the airline has still bounced them, so they had to leave them at the airport and ditch them. Fantastic if you want to go and do a survey the next day. So having the right documentation is really important, but also looking into the airline sites before you go out with the gear 
avoid scenarios where you're going to end up in a, getting stopped and, and, and blocked from taking a particular gear on a plane. Okay, and this goes for cargo shipping also. So checking that the, the courier path actually permits what you're trying to ship out is very, very important. Now, DAP and DDP. If you've ever been delivered a package from overseas and then all of a sudden they're asking for you to pay extra cash for the thing that you purchased, that's because you've got a DAP shipment. Okay, you buy something from Amazon in the States, it gets delivered to you, and then you're still stuck paying something more than the listed price. That was DAP. DDP basically means the shipper is the person who is responsible for owning the cost. So if I'm sending a survey kit out to a customer, I don't want their logistics center to be fronted a bill before they've been able to accept the goods. Most of the time they'll say, no, we've paid you for the survey, we're not paying anything else. So this is something to keep in mind. So when you are shipping, choose the right method. Otherwise, you potentially run into situations where the, the delivery entity that's picking up the, the goods bounces the delivery altogether. What we also noticed was routing. We'd have surveys happening all over Europe, all over um, EMEAR, and we'd often run into the scenario that we'd ship out from Munich, Halberg, Moos, and then to, to the UK, for instance, and then the next survey that needs to be done is in Scotland. So from London to Scotland would be the most logical route, but if we're always returning the goods to the same point of, of the um, initial delivery, we're losing time on the gear being shipped, and basically we need to have more survey kits out there in the field. So choosing an optimal route for the gear to be delivered. So instead of going uh, from point to point, point to multi-point is typically the best routing method that you can choose to ensure that your gear is optimized and, and gets to the places that it needs to go without unnecessary um, delivery. <laughs> so standardization. So in order to get point to multi-point working, you need to make sure that the kits are standardized. So perhaps you're doing an enterprise survey and there's no need for the Gilaru um, patch antennas, the 2513 antennas, the big gray one, in that enterprise survey. However, if the next location that you're shipping out to could potentially be a stadium, maybe it's important that that antenna's there. So our, our method was always ensuring that the kits are standardized to uh, accommodate whatever scenario may come up next, and then you're never going to run into a situation that the the gear is not in this kit, but it's in another one and everything else. So from this list, I, this is all standard stuff, you know, tripod, et cetera, et cetera. One thing which is very important and it saves the day, duct tape, <laughs> make sure it's in your kits. It helps out in strange scenarios that you wouldn't expect. You know, you can pull off MacGyver moves in using duct tape under circumstance. Um, so customs clearance, this is something which is also significant. If you're using a, a logistics entity, they may say, send the gear over to us, it's okay, it'll stay with us before we ship it over to the Middle East. Do not do this unless you have a corporate place of residence at the logistics company, you can under, or you can be fined significantly when there's a spot check. Customs may come to your door and say, okay, show me the gear which is being uh, shipped off to, to Saudi Arabia. We say, oh no, that's down the street at our customs uh, location, you know, 300 meters away. You're going to get a bill. <laughs> You're going to get a significant fine for breaking your ownership of the customs items during that point in time, unless that logistics center has ownership and an entity related to your organization there. Breakage. So we're doing surveys of all sorts of locations, mining sites. Um, submarines, all sorts of different locations, and they're not always the types of locations that you would typically be placing an access point multiple times, bringing it up and bringing it down. We try and get everything back in one, in one piece, but it is important to factor in the potential that something goes missing. For some reason, I don't know what it is, this one part, <laughs> which connects up the, the mounting bracket on our antennas. It seems to go missing every single time we send out the kit for survey. <laughs> it 
And it's one item that is not on a list that we can request again, so we need to order a whole new antenna. But things happen, you know, the best you try, there's always gonna be something which somehow goes missing, a screw, a bolt, a rope, whatever else. So keep this in mind and, and don't kind of think, okay, I've done all my survey kits, I never need to look at them again, look at them again. Um, it's important to kind of keep in mind, okay, we are shipping gear around the world. It is possible that an AP falls from the ceiling and doesn't continue to work the way it's supposed to. So you should take this into account when you're actually involved in shipping. So the last point is the, the different certifications. Um, when sending gear internationally, you may have to look into what the export classification is for certain devices. There are websites to look this up, but to avoid the courier coming back and saying, oh, we need an ECCN, and we need to know the harmonized trade information for the specific parts, there are websites online, and try and look this up for your respective part before you ship it out, just to save yourself some time. So that was it for me. I hope this was useful, um, and good luck shipping. <laughs>